In today's video we are going to take a look at another 40 series GPU, this time is the Asus Strix Gaming. We'll start with the specs, talk about the cooling system and then take a look at benchmarks and do a quick summary, which will also take into account the price of this GPU. I'm Laser. And let's begin. For the new generation, Asus decided to change the look of their Strix lineup. Now we have much more color with a nicely contrasting red and blue on the fan shroud of the GPU, accompanied by some RGB accents. One is a Republic of Gamers text at the top of the card, the second one being the RGB stripe at the back of the GPU, which goes all the way around. You can easily control all the lighting effects from Asus dedicated software, Armory Crate. The GPU has 16GB of GDDR6X memory, coupled with 256 bit memory interface. It has 9728 CUDA cores and the core is running at maximum boost of 2535 MHz in OC mode or 2505 in standard mode. The recommended power supply is at 750 watts, but if you're planning on overclocking the card, I strongly recommend getting a more powerful PSU. During testing, the GPU drew around 270 watts while gaming and the temps were around 57 60 degrees Celsius, a really good result. The great temps are achieved thanks to absolutely much massive cooler combined with a vapor chamber which keeps everything nice and cool. And pretty quiet actually, the fans never spin up too much, so the most audible thing from the card is unfortunately coil wine. Yes, it's here same as for the 30 series, when you play high FPS games you will most likely hear a buzzing sound. Since the card is really, really heavy, inside of the box you will find a mini support dongle screwdriver thing, it's quite cool as you can just stick it underneath the card for better support, but unfortunately if you have a case with bottom fans installed it might not fit in there. In the O11 Air Mini it's okay. The only problem with this case and this GPU, which is 357mm in length, is very tight fit, so tight that I had to remove the front fans to be able to fit it in. If you're patient enough and a master at Tetris, you can fit both the card and the fan, but taking it out afterward is, in my opinion, nearly impossible. In the box, you will also find some other goodies like the Velcro cable strap, collectible card and a thank you origami which also serves as a phone holder. Let's move on to benchmarks now. We'll compare the 4080 to 4090 as well as 3090 Ti as it lands in a very similar pricing range right now. In Unigine Heaven at 1080p the card lands much closer to the 3090 Ti than the 4090 getting 7176 points, roughly 10% more than the 3090 Ti and almost 30% less than the 4090. At 1440p the difference between 4080 and 3090 Ti is even smaller just 5% and the 4090 is around 25% faster. In Assassin's Creed Valhalla at 1080p, the 4080 averages 185 FPS, which basically matches the 4090 and might mean a CPU bottleneck or an engine limitation. At 1440p, the 4080 is at 149 FPS, while the 4090 is at 169 average FPS. The 3090 Ti lags behind with 50 FPS less than the 4080. In Red Dead Redemption 2, at 1080p, the 4080 gets 166 average FPS, 34 FPS less than the 4090 and 25 more than the 3080 Ti. At 1440p we get 138 FPS average on the 4080, 38 less than the 4090 and 20 more than the 3090 Ti. In Cyberpunk, at 1080 and max settings with no ray tracing or DLSS, the 4080 gets 170 FPS on average, 22 less than the 4090 and 42 more than the 3090 Ti, a substantial difference. When we turn on ray tracing at Ultra with no DLSS, the frames drop to 89 FPS on average. However, if you use DLSS, it goes back up to 121, only 8 FPS less than the 4090 and 21 more than the 3090 Ti. When we bump the resolution to 1440p Ultra settings with no DLSS and no ray tracing, the 4080 gets 107 FPS, the 4090 is at 124 and the 3090 Ti at 103. With ray tracing on we get 59 average FPS, 20 less than the 4090 and 13 more than the 3090 Ti. With DLSS on the FPS jumps back to 108 which is 29 more than the 3090. Moving on to competitive shooters, in Apex Legends at 1080p medium settings we get average 297 FPS almost capping the game engine only 3 FPS less than the 4090 and 11 more than the 3090 Ti. At 1440p the 4090 is at 275 FPS, 
43 more than the 3090 Ti and 22 less than the 4090. In Valorant at 1080p we get 632 FPS average and at 1440p we get 577 FPS on average, very close to what the other cards offer. In Modern Warfare 2022 at 1080p the average FPS is at 257 and when we bump up the resolution to 1440p we will get 208 FPS average, both results using balanced graphics settings. So the 4080 is really powerful, sitting right between the 3090 Ti and 4090, so normally it would have been a great choice, but there is one problem, the price. At this moment it's hard to recommend spending around $1500 on a GPU, more so since the predecessor was much closer to the $800-$900 mark, but it seems that Nvidia is still trying to get rid of the excessive 30 series stock before lowering the price. So at this moment I suggest waiting with the purchase of the card as hopefully as the amount of 30 series cards drops and the pressure from AMD comes in, we should see a price drop for the 40 series GPU. Of course this is just my wishful thinking and it can go either way, so it's best if you make your decision based on your own judgment. So yeah, that basically sums it up. 4080 overall a great step up from the 3080 and even from the 3090 Ti but definitely not at this price point. Hopefully the new cards from AMD will provide a better value for gamers and force Nvidia to rethink their pricing policy. And that's it for today's video, thank you so much for watching, I'm Laser and I'll see you soon.